it's time for the Brian Rear Show on October the 30th, 2019. My guest is uh, Mimi Nelson. She's a UFO experiencer and abductee. I've known Mimi almost 10 years. I previously used to have a Vancouver UFO meetup group we met from there. So I've known Mimi, Mimi for years. I've really heard her story, understand it, and believe it. So it's quite a powerful story. So I'm looking forward to uh, her account. So let me introduce Mimi Nelson. Well, hi, Brian. Happy to be here. Yeah, Thanks great to have you on. We've been talking for a long time doing a video, so here you are. Yeah. Yeah, where do you want to start with your experiences? Holy smokes. Do you want to talk about the new meetup group? You're the co you're organizer yeah. of a new meetup group? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you were there yesterday. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the group. Um, it's been really great. We've had some really fantastic guests. Uh, we had a couple of weeks with uh, Desta Barnaby, and yep. she was fabulous. She was fabulous. Um, hope to have her back at some point. And basically what the meetup group is doing, and it's working very well, is that all of us are trying to get used to public speaking. Because a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are experiencers or abductees, we've been in the closet for a long time, and now it's time to really come out and say what we know and uh, people are still shy. So one of the things that we're hoping to do, or that I'm hoping to do with the group that might be a little different than the UFO group from before, is that we want everyone to have an opportunity to, um, to present their stories and their interests and stuff like that. So last night was my turn, yeah. and I read a little bit from my book, which was quite interesting Yeah. To so do. It's a book you're just starting now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a book that's a long time coming, um, but I figured out a way to get it out of me, <laughs> and uh, it seems to be by PowerPoint presentation that it's working best for me. So, you know, yeah. do put the points down, get the pictures, and then do the writing that fits in between, and that seems to be working better than anything has ever worked before. Good, good. Um, so hopefully it won't take too long to do it and um, I'm planning on co uh, covering genetics um, the um, the my lab situation uh, super soldier kids uh, and different things that that have happened to me as well as the abduction we, we should tell the audience abductions. my lab yeah it means military abduction a lot of people right. would, wouldn't know that yeah yeah so yeah, it's um, it's really exciting, and and it was great for me to be able to read some of it for the group last night, and and I thought that they received it very well. So I'm yeah, it was a good talk. Yeah, and we got some on video. We can interject with this video as well. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a whole. I think your whole lifetime since the beginning, you've had these kind of experiences, right? I believe so. I have very, very early memories of um, interactions with the beyond, let's say. And I also have very early memories of people in lab coats being around me. Wow. Um, wow. I was born in Uruguay, as you know, and in Uruguay after the war, there were a lot of Nazi scientists that went there. Um, and, uh, well, Nazis in general, um, but there was a lot of Nazi scientists that were there. And I think that they were probably put in very high positions in hospitals and this and that. Yeah. And I, I believe, it's my belief, that they continued some of their experimentation in Argentina and in Uruguay in the early 50s. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I have is uh, a vaccination uh, tattoo uh, where they, they vaccinated the children that were born. Uh, and they, and they uh, gave them these tattoos to say which vac vaccinations they had gotten. Oh. Now, I've met a lot of Uruguayans in my travels, yeah. and I haven't found any that have what I have even though if you look it up in the internet, that's what they say they were doing. So that was probably day one in the hospital. Wow, so, so what do you think it means? Do you think it means something more than vaccination that you're tagging? I have a feeling that they were tracking certain children. Yeah. It might have been 
luck of the draw or whatever, I don't know. It might have been very, very random or it might have been very specific. Wow. If it was specific, that means that they knew, they already knew my parents and they knew what my genetics were. Wow. Right? If it was specific. But my parents never spoke to me about that, so I don't know. You think they knew your parents? I don't. Maybe so. not. No. 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 So it might be might relate to abduction or what? So it could have been a random thing. Yeah. It could have been maybe they did all the children in one month that they were going to track for the rest of their lives and it, and the children just happened to be born during that month. We don't know, right? This is on your, your be, big toe or another toe? Yeah, it's on my big toe. So we can, we can add that to the video, video <laughs> yeah, of your big you toe. You can look at my toe later. You can but, spice that in. Yeah, it, it's... um. It's always been a strange thing to me, and I've always tried to get to see other people's toe to see if, if they had this thing or not. So I haven't come to the conclusion yet. Uh, and maybe if I ever go back to Uruguay, I'll try and get in touch with the hospital or something. But I don't know if they just picked a month or six months or a year to do these vaccinations on kids and whether the children were random, whoever was being born at that time, or if it was a very specific study that they were doing. Yeah. And I know that I've been tracked all my life. Wow. Um, I, I know it from different things that have happened to me. I would not like to call it targeted, but I would definitely call it tracked. Um, and, you know, it's possible that they, that let, let's say, that they had an experiment that was going on for the year of 1953 or for six months of the year of 1953 and every child got vaccinated on the day they were born. Wow. And it was a tracking mechanism, let's say, that, that, it, that it did have a tracker. So that means that all those children that were born in that hospital at that time for the first three months of their study would probably be tracked no matter where they go in the world and it would be known. So this is the kind of thing that I think it was for me. Um, you mean the alien also, tracking, like there's the tattoo which identifies you, but tracking I'm me some way. I'm talking about Nazi technology yeah. right now. I'm talking about Nazi tracking. So not well, alien, you mean something more? Uh, if, if they were working with the aliens, this might have been a response to something the aliens wanted them to do. Yeah. But I mean, the Nazi scientists were investigating things on, all on their own for their own reasons for genetics. Wow. Uh, how, how do you think they track? What sort of technology would they have tracked? I don't know. The technology, yeah. I don't know. What if it's an if, implant of if some they kind? Were, I would imagine it's some kind of implant. Yeah. But if they were working with, with say, with alien technology or alien help, then they might have had the technology to track people way back then. Yeah. Right? And these are possibilities. I mean, they're not they're not anything that I could say, yes, I know this for a certain. Yeah. But if you put two and two together, and if it is true that they were working with certain extraterrestrials at the time that helped them build spaceships and things like that, well, why not? Why not? Yeah, it could have been implants back then. You know, why, why not teach them other technologies that yeah. were very advanced for tracking people. Yeah. So, in that sense, I feel that I've been tracked all my life. Um, and uh, we left Uruguay quite early in my life. We went back to Argentina. But before we left Uruguay, I remember a lot of doctors coming into our house, a lot of people doing things to my body, you know, checking this, checking that. Now maybe really, how old were you? I mean, crib. Well, so you crib. can remember being in a crib, and most yes. people can't remember that. I can remember being in my crib and having people with lab coats and things all around, and you know. So how how do you remember me. such early memories? I mean, that's exceptional. I don't know. I don't know, but I do have a memory of that. And yeah. then when we went to Argentina, I was a year and a half old. And uh, I don't have any recollection recollections of doctors or any of that stuff. So I think it only happened in Uruguay. Wow! When I was quite a baby. 
for when a I year went and a half. Argentina, I remember my aunties, I remember my godparents, I remember running around in parks, you know, just having a kid's life. Oh. I, I don't have recollections of anything strange wow. happening in, in Argentina. Wow. Uh, the next place that we went to uh, was Quito, Ecuador, where my dad was from. And so we did travel quite a lot um, in, those, in those days. My father was a musician, oh. and he traveled all through South America with his group. He had a trio. I wish I had a record of them, but I don't. And he played in radio stations, so we traveled a lot. Wow. And um, eventually, uh, well, I had, I had some very interesting sort of cosmic uh, experiences when, when I was in Ecuador. Oh. So it went from medical weird stuff in my crib to just being a kid in Argentina to going to Ecuador and having sort of mystical experiences by the wow. time I was like four or five years old. Wow, can you tell us about those? Um, one of the ones that I remember, and I still use this method for going to sleep, uh, and actually it was really wonderful to hear Linda Moulton Howe talk about something very, very similar recently. Uh, that helped her as a child. Well, this this was mine. Hers was a little different, but it was in a similar vein. I would lie in bed, and my I had a window on the left side. That would, this is when we lived in Guayaquil. I had a window, and from my window I could see the sky, the stars. There were a lot of stars in Guayaquil at that time. I don't think we had as much light pollution as we have now mm. all over the world. Anyway, I would lay in my bed, and I would look at the stars, and I would make myself small. Oh. And I, it was like going from the macrocosm to the microcosm. Oh. And I had a, a real sense at the time that I could go into the microcosm and be out there in the macrocosm. Wow, so interesting. So I, I had that sense. I would look out the window and that's how I put myself to sleep. Wow. I would make myself small. How, then, how, did, how did that put you in the macrocosm? Would you be like down to a point, like a little dot? Down to a little dot like the stars, right? Oh, okay. And then when I was a little dot, then I would be out there. One of those them. dots in the star, like a star in the sky, like a dot in the yeah, sky? Yeah, and then I would be asleep. Oh. Right? So so um, I've been trying it lately, actually. Going, it's really hard now. Oh, it yeah. was easy when I was a kid, but... But uh, really making yourself small and having that sensation of getting smaller and smaller and smaller is really hard when you're wow. an adult. Yeah, as a kid you can believe anything, right? Yeah, yeah. you can believe anything. Yeah. And I believe that if I made myself small, I would be Good. out there with the stars. <laughs> so that was Good. my way of going to sleep. And, uh, and I, I felt very supported by it, actually. I felt... Okay. Uh, you know, warm and cozy feelings in my bed that, I, yeah, that I was going to be traveling. I think that's what counts. That's if it's if it feels good, it's probably good practice. It right, it felt feeling. good. It it felt like a really really good thing to do. Then also when I was in Guayaquil, um, I had a, a strange experience that was kind of a reincarnation uh, aspect of things. Um, I got very ill. I don't remember what the illness was, but I was very, very sick with really high fevers. Hmm. And um, my mother had put me in my bed or a crib. I think it was something small. It was like a small kid's day bed or something very small. And I had my hands crossed over my stomach. And a lady came in with these little blue flowers and put them in my hand like this. Mm. And all of a sudden, I had the sensation of being in a coffin, remembering the flowers on my chest of a dead woman. And I just started screaming and I, I got up and I ran around and I, 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 I'm not dead, I'm not dead. You know, so it was a reincarnation moment, I would say, wow. that I was having of remembering being in a coffin and being... Well, you remember being, a previous death? You mean a previous life? I think so, yeah. Your own memory. And nobody could understand why this kid was 
so upset with the flowers, wow. but I didn't want them anywhere near me. So oh. I think that I had a recollection of, you know, how they, they put flowers on the cadavers yeah. before they put them in so the So it's probably a memory association that could trigger some, it. Some kind of memory. And, you know, I mean, I don't know why I would be so freaking out unless it was a memory where I wasn't quite dead. Wow. And being buried, you know what I mean? Like, to, they did that a lot in the past. They, uh, they, could people be. would have a heart attack and they would bury them right away. Yeah. But they weren't actually dead. If that's the impression, maybe it's true. Unless you actually were actually witnessing your own funeral after, after you're actually dead. But well, I remember your... that when the woman put the flowers on me, it freaked me out. And I got up out of that bed and I started screaming, I'm not dead. I'm oh, not dead. I'm so not you're dead. probably your first impression is correct then. You weren't dead. Yeah, well, I wasn't dead in this lifetime, right? Yeah. And I had a, a memory, maybe my soul was remembering looking down at my body. Because yeah. I had that sense of looking down at my body with the flowers. Yeah. And then the child, me, in this lifetime, just got up and I was running around. I'm not dead, I'm not yeah. dead, I'm not dead. So that was a, that was, I had a, quite a few reincarnation type experiences when I was a kid. Wow. Um, and then this, this cosmic thing of making myself small and going out to the stars was pretty much with me, I would say, until I was 10 or 12 years oh, old. Oh, wow. Like a that. technique you would do. Yeah, and then, and then it faded, you know. So was a purpose just to help you get to sleep, or did it serve some psychic purpose? Well, I guess I was leaving my body, but in a very gentle way. Oh. You know, it's like I, 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 in, a, in the end, really, it was like astral projection. But when you think of astral projection, your body is going out. Yeah, you know, you're leaving from your body. your body in a very violent, almost, way. Right? It just slips out of your body. When you're a kid, you don't, don't remember having an out-of-body experience, so, right? You weren't What I around. did instead is I got very, very small and joined them. Yeah. You know, so the little, the little tiny star that I became would go join them. But it's the same thing. But did you have any experience? Just a more experience? gentle way of doing it. Like any memory of actually floating around and visiting around as out-of-body no, experience? No experience on that. Hmm. Uh, my experience with it was to be up there with the stars. Hmm. So... Um, I know that sounds really crazy, yeah, <laughs> but, wow. but that is how I used to get myself to sleep. Interesting. Oh. Well, it's good to share that. Okay, so that takes you, I guess, to around age 11. Any big, uh, big experiences after that, after age 11? Um, well, when um, I did my growing up in, in New Jersey and New York, and um, I, I had a lot of strange experiences around age 11. Uh, again, I was very, very sick. I got sick. Where were you then? I was in New Jersey. Oh. And I got sick from very strong um, uh, vaccinations that I had gotten at school. Uh oh. And um, I guess I was in grade four and I remember lining up and the lady, lady giving me twice the amount. She spilt a little bit of the first one and then she gave it to me again. Oh my gosh, and, was that the cause, you think? And I got really <laughs> sick. I was out of school for three months during that time. And, um, you know, I had every disease, childhood disease happen to me at the same time. I got mumps, I got oh, no. uh, diphtheria, I think, chicken pox. I got mumps, one on each side. Anyway, it kept Gosh. me at home for three months. And during that three months, I think was a time when I might have been being tracked. Wow. Um, I, I had some very, very strange things happening to me. And, uh, Do you remember what it was? Give it an example. I was... Uh, I, I'm not going to say directed, but I was inspired to jump out the window from the fifth floor where we lived over to a building that was over there next to us, over to the side, and there was a big drop of, you know, five flights. Wow. And I was inspired, and I'll just say inspired to jump over to the 
the roof uh, next door. And so I would, you know, get up on the window, aim towards the other building, and jump on the building. And then run down the stairs and do it again. Over so and succeeded over. succeeded at this. And over again. Wow. And when I look at it now, it, get, it makes me feel sick to my stomach when I remember <laughs> this memory now. Did you have some special ability to jump that far? Well, I was a, a broad jumper at school. And I was on the team, on the school team for broad jumping. I could jump really long distances. I was a really, really strong kid. I could climb and incredibly. And, um, you so, know, I think some of this might have been enhanced. I don't know. Yeah, but enhanced. Certainly, the inspiration, almost the whisper in your ear kind of inspiration that I was having to do some of these crazy things. Um, so maybe you're compelled to do it from uh, yes, some outside. Yes, I, I think I was compelled. So did you go from a standing position on the balcony and just jump without running at it? No balcony. It was just a, just the fifth floor window. Yeah. The windows that went up. Yeah. I would stand there, hold on to the window, yeah. aim for the building. There was a lot of aiming that I was doing. Yeah. And then I would jump. But the thing about it that really makes me feel sick to my stomach is that there was an alleyway between the two buildings. The other building was, yes, it was lower. It was one floor lower. Their roof was one floor. They, their building was a four-story building. But there was a humongous gap in between the two buildings where, you know, everybody put their garbage and us kids used to go down there and play. Marbles uh, how, so and, how many feet across was that gap? Well, I don't know, but certainly it wasn't four feet, you know? It wasn't, it was much, much bigger than four feet, so... An alley must be at least 20 feet or something, right? Well, the width. The of, width, yeah. Yeah, so... Well, of course, you're going down with this. I'm going down. So when, when, oh, I, when I remember these memories that happened during that time, it freaks me out. So you think you have some kind of enhanced power to jump, like you're more than normal human to jump that far? In the in the in the video that we did last night, when I was telling my experiences, there was the, there was a part where I was a, a flying teacher, and I think that that must have been happening to me when I was a kid, because in in my dream. In my lucid dream, I was teaching children how to fly. In my real life, when I was a child, I was somehow enhanced and directed to go do these trainings. Wow. So what do you and mean by flying teacher? Was that a dream, you mean? Yeah, it was a lucid dream. It wasn't like a I past was, life I was, memory? I was, was giving, I was giving flying lessons, but as I was having the dream, I remembered having those same lessons. Wow, so did, you, so did you have that dream at that time as a kid? And I remember that during that time, that time, those three months when I didn't go to school, there were a lot of very lucid dreams. Um, there were nightmares happening at the time. Um, there was, uh, my brother was reacting as well during this time. He was trying to get out of the house late at night. Um, my parents had to put a bar on the door that he couldn't move because he was sleepwalking. So wow. I think things were happening in our apartment. So you were under, under an influence, some outside of influence. Of something. Yeah. And then when this whole thing finished, um, you know, when I finally got better after the three months, um, and also I was, I was being treated by a homeopathic doctor that later had his license taken away oh. um, because he was he was doing things that that weren't allowed. So let's like, just like curing it. people. You mean <laughs> they don't want him curing people? I don't know. I don't know exactly what what the deal was, but his name was Doctor Haskalovich, and eventually he had his license taken away, and he was practicing. Um, homeopathy in a regular GP office. Because I know today they don't like them, but they cure cancer. A lot of them are getting mm -hmm. killed for cancer, so maybe so, it's on their right. Yeah, so he was giving me some really strange 
uh, concoctions to take, oh. plus the vaccinations that I that I had, um, and there was strange things happening, uh, strange dreams. My brother trying to sleepwalk. We would find him in other floors of the building. He would be wow. completely asleep. But well, when you dreamed about teaching flying, was that at that time? You mean as a kid? No, I think at that time I was being taught to do that because oh. in my real life. I joined the broad jumping team and I oh. was good for the size that I was. I could jump over six feet. Wow! And, and I was I was exceptional, exceptionally so, fit. So wh when did you have the dreams? Then when did that? Occur? I had the dreams after I had my Kundalini experience, where I remembered a lot of things. Oh, this as an adult, you mean? Yes. Not when you're like eleven. Yeah. So now I'm talking about being eleven. Oh, okay. But the strange thing that happened when I was eleven is that when all these diseases finally went through me and I got whatever the, you know, whatever effect they were supposed to do on me. Uh, maybe it was just immunity, I don't know, but they all came all at once. And um, when I finally went back to school, every single morning when we were trying to get ready for school, I would have a nosebleed. Hmm. Wow. Now, from every all the research that I'm that I've done in the meantime, in years, in the meantime, one of the telltale signs of children being abducted is, is a bloody nose. Yeah. Right? In the morning. So this was happening every single day that I was, wow. I was getting up. Some even get school. implants right in the nose bone. Yeah, I was, I was getting up, going to school, and the nose bleeds. So hmm. pretty much I was like driving in the car like this with, you know, with Kleenex up my nose wow. and stuff, and it was so annoying to my parents. And they took me to a specialist, and the specialist that said that it, it goes away. So eventually it did go away, but that was one of the things that I really remember that was happening that was happening in New Jersey that was really strange. A super strength. Yeah. Um, they kept wanting me to go into special programs. And my parents didn't speak a lot of English, and they didn't think that I should be with older kids. They kept wanting to skip me grades. And Is this because of your strength, or like why the special programs? Um, because I was I was advanced. I was too advanced for my grades. Well, you mean you're scholastically advanced as well? Yeah, and they wanted to skip me grades and put me in special classes. Oh, so high IQ kid, you mean? I was, yeah, and uh, now I'm not. <laughs> you know, now, now I've lost my IQ. But uh, hey, you, you mentioned you have memory we, memory wipes now. Yeah. At that time, you're an exceptional bright kid. Yeah, you seem I to have, have these photographic powers. memory. Really? I had photographic memory, and I had, you know, I wouldn't say that I had superpowers, but I. But I had enhanced physical health, uh, you know, enhanced that I could do crazy things. So I think, thinking back on it now, of course then I just took it a stride. But thinking back on it now, it is possible that they were grooming me to be some kind of a super soldier. Now is this, uh, do you think it's military abduction or do you think it's alien, the super soldier? I don't know. I don't know. Up, yeah. up until this day, I don't know. I'd like to work with a regressionist and I'd like to yeah. go into these memories and find out exactly what was happening at the time. You mentioned but, these like German National Socialist time you're born. Yes, I wonder right. is this, so, is this you know, human or is it so alien? Maybe I was still being tracked when I was in New Jersey. Maybe, yeah. maybe these people that were trying to get me into the special programs that my parents wouldn't allow me to go into. Uh, you know, I remember taking a lot of IQ tests. I remember um, being put in a room with other kids and them telling us to move the pencil with our mind. I have memories like this. Well, let's talk about that because I know there's other cases of people who said even but back in the 1950s. But my parents wouldn't bite. They would not do it. They would not oh. let me go into special classes no matter what. But what they age said, when you're moving the cyclically move? Because there's, there's a fellow I saw on YouTube, uh, and even in the 1950s, as a little kid, he was trying to move a ball and they were testing these kids. And he didn't make the cut, so he, mm -hmm. he was kicked out. But he could. Right. It seems what we know now: the military, by the early 1950s, they were trying to compete against the aliens or to build our they defense. They were trying team. to find psychic kids. And you were born in 1953, so. 53, yeah. So it could have been the military at that point. It could have been, 
and you know, or or more of this Nazi experimentation just moving forward, right? Well, you would think it's connected to the American government, right? If it's Uruguay, even if it's you know Nazi, you would kind of wonder. Yeah, if it's but still... but the Nazis, the Nazis well, went skip... to the states after World War II. They went under paperclip. Yeah. And they came up with so many inventions and so much of the. The stuff that we have in the space program and yeah. uh, the drugs, uh, hype, uh, what are the psychotropic drugs that they experimented with, so much information on psychology, yeah. uh, psychic information, it, it all basically came from these people and the experiments that they were already doing in Germany, the horrors yeah. of all of that stuff that was happening in Germany, they just brought those programs to the Americas. I don't that's think it was. I, think. I don't think it was so horrible. That, I think that's propaganda. But are you saying in uh, Uruguay there was something separate from that? Like the real um, Germans not under American control. That's the theory. Right. I think that that there was probably a breakaway that went to Argentina and Uruguay. And maybe Antarctica too. Maybe you're, you're aligned with those. Yeah, I don't know about Antarctica yeah. because I didn't live there. But I did live in Uruguay and I did live in Argentina. And even today, the racism and and signs of Nazi thinking is very, very much there. Wow, so you're um, kind of a special case. You're not just an American, but you're like from Uruguay and that influence. You're not, I, you're I not a project paper. I just cut. kind of think, okay, let's say, let's say hypothetically, that I was tracked from the time I was born. Well, you know, we went to Ecuador, we went to Argentina, you know, then we went to the States. So if they were tracking, then they would still be tracking, yeah. uh, you know, and maybe trying to get me into programs there. I don't know. But all I know is that my parents really protected me. Um, they kept me from those programs. Although I did go to summer programs where a lot of different strange things also happened wow. that I won't go into. but. But, There's um, kind of two forces that they they want you in this program because you're a gifted child, and then your parents were holding back. My parents were holding back. So it's like they would get you sometimes and get you into something. Yes. Wow. And I think that a, a lot of that was happening at nighttime, when my parents had no idea. Oh. You know, and it was probably happening to my brother too because he was sleepwalking and everything. Why well, you not? Know, Unless do... he was sleepwalking because I'd been taken. Who knows? But something was going on at that time. But that I, I know a woman building. previously from our meetup here. She's got two twin sons, and he actually says, "I go to, I go to an alien hospital, and he goes to an alien school. So at night, right here in Vancouver area, they would get abducted." An alien hospital here yeah, in Vancouver. Yeah, I met a person. He says, "I go to an alien hospital." His mother described to me how they, how their school. So that night, they would get mm -hmm. abducted. To go to a school and some alien ship and then put back in their bedroom. Right. So I wonder if that's what's happening to you, something at night. Well, like, yes, well, definitely training at night, which I found out later when I was telling the experience of after my Kundalini rising, so much memory came back to me. And then I was flying around in ships, I was training other kids to, to, to yeah. fly, you know, and, and just having these lucid dreams that when I came back from them, I would swear that I'd been there, you know, it was like, almost like the body crashing back into my bed, like, whoop, you know, yeah. and waking up and just like, oh my God, and not really knowing if I was now in reality or if that had been reality, that kind of, that kind of confusion that you feel when you're yeah. in a lucid dream, right? When you're in a lucid dream, it's bright. The colors are bright. Uh, and things feel solid. You feel like you're really physically there. It sounds like you're actually abducted regularly at night, a real abduction, whether it's alien or my lab, and you have those real experiences, and then they put you back. Because we know today that's pretty common for uh, alien abductions or my right. lab. So in real time, you're gone for a few hours and put you back. So you think that's actually what happened to you? You're literally, literally abducted regularly. To have this education and the and the thing the thing was that um, I was being I was being trained in in a special way I'm sure because the books that I was reading I was reading college level books at grade ten and uh, at age ten 
you know, I would go to the library and, and, and take out books on psychology, take books out on, on uh, science and, you know, and, and a lot of different things that really should, I should not even have been able to understand, and yet mm. I could. Wow. So, uh, and I had this photographic memory, so I didn't really have to study. Um, I would just read the book and remember and then write the test. Wow. Um, unfortunately, that can backfire on you because then you don't remember. Sometimes you don't remember what you've actually studied because you're oh. just reading it off the page. Yeah. You know, but that, that was with me for a long, long time. And, you know, I, I think that there probably was a moment when they wanted to use me for some of these programs, you know. Uh, it, I don't think that it happened because my parents did not let me out of their sight. Uh -huh. um, you know, which night, also though. makes me think that maybe things had happened to them that made them so against it. Yeah, because the tents run hot in families. So my, right. I think, do you think you were literally abducted on night though? Because they can't control when you're asleep when and they're asleep. asleep. Yeah. So it seems to me you actually were abducted. But, you know, I wanted to go to summer camp, for instance. Yeah. My parents were adamant against it. No, no, no. <laughs> they wouldn't let us out of their sight. Oh, wow. Yeah, no. We were not allowed to go anywhere alone without them. Absolutely not. So they, they not saw to, something. They, they, needed, they needed to have us sleep in our beds and to know what we were doing. So that... That, you know, my father had said certain things to me during life that made me think that maybe he'd had some of these experiences. And on his deathbed, um, the one of the last conversations that we had just before he died, is he told me that, you know, he had wanted to, st to stay in the army and that he loved the army and uh, that he wanted to do his life in the army. Well, I don't know too many soldiers that love the army, you mm -hmm. know, but there was something about it that, that was really calling to him, and his family didn't let him do it. They didn't let him become an officer. Um, when he did his uh, conscription time, he was out. But it is significant you're the daughter of someone who's in the army because we know abductions happen more with military families. Right. And that and so we didn't that, know that until now. He mentioned and that my and that my father loved the army, and then he you know he felt that he felt that he had missed missed his moment that he had missed his real calling in life his real career. Did he leave the army before you were born? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But I wonder if the whole alien abduction thing happened to him while he was in the army. And I don't then, know. then he gets tagged and it happens to his kids. Like we know what happens in families, it runs in right. families. Right. And and I don't know, but my father was very you know, it was basically he was telling me a secret on his so he loved the, Do you know why he loved the army so much? No, I don't. <laughs> what, was his, said, what was his what was his rank? Said, he told me that he felt always in all his life that he missed his calling in life, mm -hmm. that he was supposed to be in the army. Yeah, that's what he told me. You know, and, he, and we were talking about following your dream, and at that time I was at, at art school, and I was following my dream, and so he was saying to me, "Follow your dream." Yeah. Because I didn't, and I've regretted it all my life. You know, so he wanted me to follow my, my dream oh, as, wow. as an artist and to continue with it. Um, yeah, so that that's always stayed with me, you know, that my dad would say something like that. Did he tell you his military life, like what rank he, he was or what he did in there? Um, they have conscription in Ecuador. I don't know if they still have it, but it's mandatory for young men. I think they have to go in for two years. Yeah. And he did his two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he loved it, and he wanted to stay in it, but but. Uh, well, um, his family wanted him his out. His family wanted him oh. out and didn't give him permission. He was still young, you know. He yeah. was still. They didn't give him permission to do that. Hmm. So in the end, he ended up traveling with his band and going, leaving oh. anyway, leaving Ecuador anyway, and, and and meeting up with my mom in Argentina. But a story, the musician wishes he stayed in the army. <laughs> I know, right? Like, totally different. 
but many of but us. But it have makes you wonder, kinds of like, because if your contradictions, uh, right, people. relates to you being an abductee, the army, you wonder if something special must have happened. You it just makes you wonder. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what he encountered that he loved so much, but he wasn't allowed to do it. And uh, my mom never spoke of anything like that, no regrets or anything about anything in her life or that she'd had any encounters with angels or oh. anything, right? My mom never did. But my mom was RH negative blood. What so about your dad? My dad was positive blood. What about you? I'm positive. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, I mean, my mom carried that, whatever that is in her genes already, right? Mm. The Celts and Basques and small percentage of people on earth carry. Yeah. Um, it's, it's about 15%, I think, of all the people. Wow. Um, and they're really within these very tight... Uh, family groups they're within the Basque people you know the Celts have this 15% thing and not very many other people you know mm. so it's it's something rare I don't know what it is but it's rare and she had a lot of trouble when she had us kids um, she almost died when she had my brother when she had me we had a lot of a lot of problems with me not being able to, to take her milk, you know, because no. it's almost like two species. Yeah. Right? Well, I think the theory about uh, RH positive, meaning rhesus, RH rhesus monkey, is that people are positive, and positive are, we're related to the monkey world, the negative is something more alien or higher, that negative is a higher status. I think that's the theory. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Some people say the RH negative is a throwback from Neanderthal. And that Neanderthal never got uh, spliced with monkey. Okay. You know, um, so there is there is that possibility. We don't know. You know, some people are really, really into these things, and I don't know. I don't like anything that takes unity away. I don't like anything that divides people and it turns them into us and them. I don't like that, so I don't okay. really plug into these things, but they're there. They're out there. Yeah, I guess there's you differences. Know. And it's part of my history. Um, it, it is part of my history, and my mom remembers that, you know, when she was young, there was a lot of Nazi activity in her country. Nazis basically wow. took over the government, and, you know, they ran things. This is still so. Uruguay, right? Argentina. She oh, was from Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. Yes, that so, was about 1945 to 52, right? With Juan Perón. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, uh, hospitals were run a certain way. I, I mean, everything was changed, right? <laughs> wow. When you so, get back to, you were saying at, at night your parents were falling in. Do you, do you really think you were abducted at night? What's your I do believe I was being abducted at night. And a regular thing, right? Yeah. And um, one of the, one of the, Telltale we things. have to watch this makes noise this chair. Oh, one of the telltale things obviously is the nosebleeds Yeah, and and they happened every single day. Wow. So I was being taken every single night And there was no reason for it because my mom took me to the doctor and there was no reason for it There was nothing wrong with my sinuses. They checked everything. There was no reason yeah. You know, so so I think yeah, I think I must have been taken so do you think it was an uh, alien, a Nazi, or U.S. military? <laughs> How would I know? Yeah. I it seems know. more alien to have all those training, all those abilities. I thought the thing with my labs is uh, after people get abducted by aliens, the military wants to know what did they do to you, what did they say right. to you, and they interrogate you. Yes. That doesn't seem to be your experience. Okay, but if you've ever listened to Andy Basciago, and some of the other people that claim to have been trained since youth for the Mars program, they were creating super kids, right? It was the military. Oh, okay. It was the military that was creating super kids. Oh, okay. And even at that time, if you listen to Andy Basciago, his father used to take him, and they went to underground bases, 
And even then, he claims that they went through portals and things like that. Wow. Where you okay. could be, you could be, uh, you know, say in Cincinnati one moment, and then you'd be in Nevada. Yeah. Right. You jump rooms. You could just jump, jump to Mars. Yeah. So they, he claims that when he was a kid, but he was a kid in the seventies. I was a kid in the sixties. Yeah. Right. So he says that the Mars program started in the seventies. I think that there might have been a precursor precursor program of some sort, maybe not a Mars program, but but uh, a, a program that was trying to find people that were special, that had special gifts. So you think so, you might have been in that program? Yes. So maybe it was military then? It could have been. Yeah. And I've always felt that it was. Well, there you go. I, so I would say you trust know, your because, feeling. Trust your because, feeling. Because um, the the people who have been in those programs, they all say that they're military, that they were military abductions, there and you that go. the military had really advanced uh, ways of, of, of getting them to the bases. And yeah, stuff well, like you that. know more about it than I do. So now, one thing, right. one thing that I cannot remember is I can't remember in my childhood any bases. And, and all the super soldier kids remember being on bases. I do not remember that. Mm. The only memories I have of people doing things to me is from the crib. But later, I don't remember going into underground places that were creepy or, you know, it wasn't like that. Yeah. It wasn't like that. But um, Do you think at some point you didn't make the cut and they decided to, to dump you as a... I think... Um, I started smoking at age 12 and um, somewhere between 11 and 12 I started smoking and all of these experiences stopped happening oh. and even the nosebleeds stopped happening. Oh. So interesting but um, yeah I think you know probably at that point they, they stopped taking me. Wow. But then when I was 14, I had my actual UFO experience that I remember. I remember seeing the ship and being scared. And yeah, maybe we should talk about that now because we've gone sure. from like 12 to 14. Yeah. So and This so, is in Ecuador so now. So let's say that from 12 to 14, I listened to the Beatles and babysat and did all the, you know, all yeah. the... All the things that, that 1965 that to 67 the peak of the Beatles right it helped and I was movie. just totally into records and dancing right and on. going to going to dances and you know being involved in music and I just loved it and I loved my friends um, I had four really really close friends and we had a little band together so there was no woo, -woo stuff during ah, that time right ah. then I went to Ecuador my dad sent me to Ecuador he wanted me to uh, not forget the language, so in, uh, at the end of middle school, he sent me to a private school in Ecuador, Oh. and that's how I ended up there again at the age of 14. Oh. Uh, actually, he sent me there at the age of 12. And um, Were you happy there, or were you not happy there? Uh, I was happy there. I wasn't happy about leaving, because yeah. I left great friends. But my parents considered them to be bad influences, so they sent me there, and they sent me to a private school down in Ecuador, and, um, you know, it was just a, basically just a normal, normal uh, school life, you know, good, good marks, um, lots of studying. I had to study in Spanish, which was different for me, because I'd done all my school in English, so oh. suddenly school was in Spanish and I had to work hard. You saw the good memory, like a photographic memory, all of that? Photographic memory did help. <laughs> it wow. did help. But I got involved in sports. I, I, I played um, basketball. I played volleyball in that school. And, uh, you know, for one year I was a cheerleader. So there was lots of physical activity that was happening during that time in, in my life and not really um, not really too much in dreamland, you know, like, I, I don't remember nosebleeds and hmm. being taken at all during that time. But I went to visit a friend who lived uh, in an army neighborhood 
and her father was an army general. They were supposed to be stationed in Ecuador for three years. She's an American. American She's family. an American. American general. Uh, yes. And he was a blonde man. Uh, he was a blonde man, but I think maybe her mom had been from Hawaii because my friend really looks Hawaiian. Oh. My friend Doris. She looked very Hawaiian. Uh, the beautiful Hawaiian hair and you know, beautiful lips and just a beautiful girl, mm. absolutely beautiful girl. And um, anyway, we became friends. Her brothers were in some of my classes at my school, and uh, I went to visit them one night, and both of us were smokers. Oh. She was 15, I was 14. Oh. I'd been smoking for two years at that point. And um, so we wanted to sneak out of the house. Bedtime for them was 10 o'clock. So we wanted to sneak out of the house, have a cigarette, and then come back in and go to bed. So, you know, we had to be in bed at 10 o'clock. We, lights out were at 11, but we had to be in our beds at 10 o'clock at her house. That was the rules. So it was 9.40 when we went out to have this quick cigarette. We walked out her door and down the block for half a block and we went one block that way and then we turned. And when we turned, after the one block, we saw something in the sky that looked like a really bright moon. Hmm. And we're like, wow, look at that, look at the moon. And then we, we kept looking at it. but. It was coming fast and it was getting bigger, uh -huh. like big, you know, it started out the size of a quarter in the sky, but bright, really yeah. bright. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's getting bigger and bigger. And then the next memory I have of that is it being blue and green, like a most beautiful blue, turquoise blue, and the most beautiful green with a little bit of light yellow at the top, like uh -huh. a bump, like a fried egg kind of bump. And then it was spinning, spinning as if it was slowing down. And that's wow. the last memory that I have of it. And we were scared because we could see that it was slowing down. First it came like, then it went over here and it was slowing down. So uh -huh. we figured it was going to get us. Wow. So we ran away. We ran away as soon as it was, you know, we actually we ran away when it was coming at us and it was white yeah and then we looked back and it was over here oh. slowing down okay you're panicking so i'm not sure when i have this memory i'm not sure if the light that came actually took us right then and there and what we were seeing at the end when we looked back was after they let us go and it was just hovering. That's what I was thinking. And thinking well, what happened? Know. How did it disappear though when it was slowing down? How did it disappear? Well, we ran away. I have no oh, idea. Oh, so you don't know whether it flew away or disappeared on the spot? We saw it coming and coming fast. It was like yeah. if you imagine that you're seeing the moon in the sky and then the moon starts coming at you, you know, yeah. and it's like very big in the sky and you run away because you realize it's not the moon yeah but a very big white light so you didn't see but then when we it. turned around after we were walking we saw a ship hovering with you know um like if you've ever seen a top slow down and how yeah. the stri the colors the stripes kind yeah. of meld into yeah, each yeah. other, Change. that's that's what it was doing. It so that might have been after the fact. It might have been after the fact. <laughs> yeah, because after I have all over. very very strong memories of the white light coming fast. Yeah. And then when I did my regression that I talked about last night, in the regression I could feel how I, I was lifted into the beam. Yeah. Right? And and I had no conscious memory of that. But I, I remember running away and looking back and then the thing was just hovering and, and and looking absolutely beautiful. Like I've never seen those colors. 
Wow. Life. I've never seen those colors again. Sounds and like in Butterscotch Mall to the heavens, they described indescribable colors that we don't know on our yeah, earth. Yeah, <laughs> these colors, you know, I can say turquoise, but it doesn't even wow. begin to explain it. It would be like, you know, how day glow colors are. If, if you could get the day glow thing into the most beautiful turquoise color. Wow. You know, and then add light to it. So it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. You're scared, but it was beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. But I mean, we were absolutely terrified. Sure. So Most we, we, would be. when we saw the light coming at us, and it was the speed at which it was coming at us that scared us. Of course. If we had seen a hovering ship just going like this and being beautiful, I think maybe we would have stayed there and gone, wow, what's that? Yeah, yeah, But yeah. because this thing was coming at us, actually really coming for us, and we knew that it was, we ran away. Of course. You know, obviously, they grabbed us while we were running and pulled us up to the ship. But our memory was running away, and then we got to her house. Cause like I said, we were a block and a half from her house. We got there, we had left at 9.40, and it was 1.20 in the morning. Wow, so that's like uh, three hours and 40 minutes later. Right. And her family was up in arms. They were so <laughs> upset. So, so, so upset. Like they're angry, you two. Angry. You two brats. Upset. They thought we'd gone off clubbing. You know, uh, they were convinced that we'd gone off clubbing. And we were like, no, we don't know, we don't know. And we were confused. We didn't know what to say. Did you know what time it was, though? Did they, they say, hey? They told us. They told us. So you were stunned, we're... right? How could this be? Right. And we <laughs> we were absolutely in, in, in utter confusion. Yeah, of course. And we're like, uh, uh, you know, this kind of thing. And they weren't letting us talk because they were like, you're bad. You're going home. I've called a taxi. I'm calling a taxi. You're never coming back here again. Miriam, you know, and 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 her father was angry at me, angry, so angry. Because this is a boarding house of some kind, because your parents weren't there, right? You weren't living no, there? No, um, I lived with my aunt and my uncle and oh. my cousins, oh. but this was the, the, generals. The, um, the general's neighborhood where all the military lived in this neighborhood. Oh, this, they're going to send you back home? Yeah. They were going to send me back home to my, my family. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and he's go and pack up and they, they sat her in a chair. Her mom went into the room with me, into the bedroom. They didn't even let us be together. He sat her in a chair right by the door. Her mom went into the room with me. We packed up my stuff. She held my hand like that. Oh, I mean, you were sleeping over. That was the idea. I was sleeping over. I was going to sleep over. So she helped me pack my things. Well, this was just a, a fun sleepover thing. You didn't live yeah. there. It was just no, a sleepover. No, it was thing. just a sleepover. It was just. Oh. It was uh, Easter vacation. It was oh. in April. It was Easter vacation from school. 1967. And I was, was going to spend a couple days with them. You know, just at their house visiting. So the mother was like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, well, the general smacked my friend in the face, and he sat her down. That's his she daughter, was, right? Yeah, she was crying. Smacked her in the face. He smacked her in the face because they thought we'd been out clubbing, drinking, yeah. being with boys, who knows, right? Yeah. And then the mother grabbed my hand and went into the room, and we packed up all my things. And she's like, shh. Don't say anything, don't say anything, it'll just upset him. Because I was like, we don't know, we didn't do anything. And she's like, Shh, zip it, right? Does she, know, does she know something? No, she was just trying to calm the situation yeah. down. Because yeah. her father was ready to beat Doris up. And he, she didn't want us to say anything to make him more mad. Yeah, yeah. Right? She said, Shh, just don't talk, just get in the taxi <laughs> and go home and... You know, we'll deal with this later. So, I went home. My uncle was called. I went home. I got a beating when I got home for clubbing. He hit, he hit you? Slapped you? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, my uncle hit me as well. So, he slapped me in the face really, really hard and called oh, me names. Holy smokes. And they, they thought that we had gone to some illicit place, right? Like, for three hours. I got home. The taxi took me home. My uncle was furious with me again. They thought that we had been doing 
whatever bad things and wouldn't let me talk. I think now that I did talk to my cousins about it because I noticed when I when I did um, an interview, a little Facebook thing with Jaime Rodriguez, that some of my cousins were part of that group in Ecuador. So I think I must have talked to them, and I really want to get in touch with my cousins and, and, and find out why they joined that group and if they remember my story. Oh. Anyway. How um, recent were you in touch with the cousins? Uh, on Facebook? I wasn't in touch with them. I just noticed them because it was like a, a chat room. Oh. And I noticed their names, and they were chatting and asking questions while I was talking. So they're witnesses so, to, to that time. Yes, they might be. Because I didn't know they were into UFO stuff, but two of my cousins, one wow. from Chile and one from Ecuador, were on the were were on the live thing, live feed. Anyway, so um, I wasn't allowed to talk about it because he thought that I was lying about it. He said he didn't want to hear any lies. He'd rather hear nothing. So I said nothing. And my friend, I think that she did tell her father. And at that time, in the 60s, there were a lot of army people there and Peace Corps people that were involved with UFO research. Yeah, that was a big time, a lot of flaps in the 60s yes. of UFOs. Yes, and even later on in the 70s, we met some, uh, we met some people, young people from the army and also from, from what I just said, from um, Peace, Peace Corps that were involved in internet, setting up internet down there, uh, and, and investigating UFO stuff. What do you mean internet? Internet. They were setting up internet. Like the military had in 1969, they invented the internet, right? It was just for the That's military. That's what they say. Yeah. That's what they say. So you but say... It was already, it was already there. Even in, before 69? In, in, uh, in 1972, 1971-72, it was already there. Yeah, I think they, they were admitted, already yeah. connecting all the universities to each other, wow. connecting to the Central Library, connecting all of South America with internet. Yeah. So maybe they they tested it out there first. I don't oh. know. I don't know the story. I just know, you know, what the story that we hear, which is not always the truth because I remember talking to the Peace Corps guys and that's what they were doing. Yeah. And then we met some soldiers, my friend and I, that I went with, we met some soldiers and they started to talk about UFOs and there was a lot of this going on from their buddies, like, shut up. Wow, wow. You know, so there was a lot of activity there. There's always been a lot of activity in the Andes. Yeah, we know that, for yeah. sure. And so, anyhow, I think, that my friend, and I never was able to see her again, except wow. one time, but I think her friend, my friend probably did tell her father, and her father just forbid her from ever telling anyone, and we were put together by her brothers, clandestine, met behind a bush kind of thing, in their going away party. Now, they were, they were stationed there for three years. After this incident, boom, they were out of there. They got them out. They were out before three weeks was over. Really? Yeah, they got them out within two weeks. I think it's it was because... a whole family, like three brothers, the daughter, the mom, the dog, the dad, the house, you know, and in two weeks. Was it because the three years was over because of this no, incident? No, the three years was not over. They had just gotten there. Wow. They got them out. So because of this incident then? Probably, I would say, and she met with me. She wasn't allowed to meet with me, but there was a bar uh, going away barbecue for them, and her brothers arranged for us, for her to go to the hedge and for me to come from the street to the hedge so that we could meet and talk. And so what did you say that time? When she met with me, she said she's not allowed to ever talk to me again, obviously. I wasn't allowed to talk to her either. Um, just because my uncle thought she was the bad influence, and I figured her family thought I was the bad influence. 
you know, because they thought we were partying. Of course, we weren't. Did you talk about the abduction or what else? She said that her dad said, this is why I think he did let her tell the story. <clears throat> she said that her dad said that if we ever told anybody, they would put us in an insane asylum, that no one would believe us, and that we would think we were crazy, and, the, you know, basically the white coats would come and get us. So she made me promise that I would never tell. So, okay, that happened. It was really a weird time for me, especially not being able to talk about it. I had but, given my word. But do you think uh, him being a general, he knew about abduction? I think he did. He knew about it. And yeah. That's why he had to shut up about it, because they, of course, they right. don't, want, don't want to talk about it. Yeah, and I think that, you know, his daughter <clears throat> being picked up was probably a really big no-no. Oh. Right? I think that wasn't supposed to happen. So you think they're, they're coming well, for you was. and she was there? Or maybe, they... maybe they were coming for her and I just happened to be there. Or maybe but they're coming for you and she happened to be there. It's possible. Or maybe, you know, these things are predestined and we were supposed to be together and they were supposed to pick both of us up. Wow. But in my regressions, I don't see my friend at all. Uh, I don't see her at all. She's not on the ship with me. I'm having my own private conversation with the aliens. Nowhere to be seen. Oh, so it's more about you then? Well, my memory is about me. Maybe her memory is about her. Or but you said you've had, had six, separated... six experiences? Or the abduction experiences or UFO experiences? No, I've had the one that's conscious memory, this one that I'm telling you about. Yeah. I've had two regressions about it. And I want to have more. Yeah. I want to have some more regressions to see what went on as a kid. Yeah, yeah. To see if there was any super soldier stuff going up, happening as a kid before I started smoking. And um, because I have these memories of, of being in these rooms, trying to push pencils, you know. There you go. And taking all these IQ tests all the time, all these crazy tests. Wow. And trying to put things together. So wow. whatever it was, they were testing children. Yeah. For these things, and um, I got tested a lot. But didn't you say you had six UFO experiences throughout your life? Uh, no, uh, the one that I tell about is the one that is physical that I can remember okay, I guess I was being mistaken, in yeah. physical life. <clears throat> uh, there may have been more. I've had lots of sightings. Okay, you that's know, what I meant. Sightings. Of sightings. I've had many, many sightings. But, um, well, that's actual, significant right there. Abductees. Actual abduction where the, the ship comes and comes to get me. This is the one that I remember. But we know like from David Jacobs' research, abductees, they see a lot of sightings, but they don't remember their abductions. Right. The, the sign that you have a lot of sightings that indicates you're an abductee. Because right. ordinary people don't have a lot of sightings. They might have right. one. Right? right. I've had one. Yeah. Right. Right. Wow, so that indicates you're probably a regular abductee. Grant awesome. Cameron says it's like every month with abductees. That's what he says. Mm. But of course, it's wow. suppressed from your memory. Possibly. Anyway, um, I went through a period of, of life, during some periods of my life, where, you know, I didn't want to sleep. I didn't oh. want to have experiences, and so I didn't want to sleep. You didn't want to get abducted in your and, sleep. And yeah. there were times when I would stay up the whole night, and I wouldn't sleep until the morning. Because you're afraid of getting abducted? And you... I was afraid of whatever, especially the my lab experiences were really awful. They were horrific and um, not pleasant in, in the least. So Yeah, you talked so much about so that last Nightmarish, night. very yeah. nightmarish, yeah. Yeah, what do you want to talk about next? I mean, um, well, I wanted to, to finish the story. So, yeah. Um, so I didn't see Doris again, and for some reason, her last name has been erased from my memory. I don't remember her father's name or her brother's or or her last name, and I've been invited to go to Ecuador to be with Jaime and. Uh, and he's going to help me to try and find the school that they went to so we could get their names and then hopefully to find Doris. Wow. Yeah. And see what happened in her life, you know, 
in the 50 years that have passed yeah. since then. I'm very interested to, to know, you know, and she was an army brat, so I know they got moved. Um, a lot of things happened to army kids, so I would be very interested to find out if more of these experiences happened or if that was the only one with her. Yeah. And also it would be, you know, it, it would be proof, more proof, definitive proof that I was with someone and that we saw this and that it happened. Yeah, someone so, confirm your experience. Yeah, I would like that. So anyway, um, fast forward about three years. Oh, actually, the next thing that happened was I was really upset with my uncle because he wouldn't let me talk about what had happened. I just like talk to the hand kind of thing, you know. So I wanted to go back home to the States and I ended up leaving that summer. I went back to New Jersey and um, just before my birthday, I went back to New Jersey, but I didn't finish school. So I screwed up in that way. Um, and I had to repeat that grade, which was so painful for me because the, the school in Ecuador is so far beyond the, the system, is so far beyond in science and math. I had it, right? Everything I had, I had. And you were skipping grades before. Right? Yes, and then I had to be back a grade. So, so, because, so because why? Because I left at the wrong time. Oh. But um, <clears throat> I went to see the consul that was the American consul that was there at the time. I talked to him. I don't remember if I told him the experience that I had, but he stamped my visa. And I was a minor, I was not even 15. And he stamped my visa to go back. So I must have told him a pretty good story. Wow. And, um, and so I, I took my plane back, I, I went. My friend's dad picked me up and I landed up in, in, in my father's house and um, and they were very upset you know because again they thought that I'd been doing bad things and I, there was no one to tell. What, what country was your dad in? That uh, in New Jersey. My Back parents in Jersey, were in New yeah. Jersey and my brother and I were in Ecuador. <clears throat> yep. So I went home and there was more like oh you did the wrong things you made your uncle mad and la la you know. So life for me started becoming nightmarish. My parents didn't trust me anymore. Just because that one incident. Well, yes, because we were missing for three hours and no one would tell. They wouldn't listen to us, and I guess maybe we tried to tell. Strict family. It was, huh? just, it was just a story that was too weird. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but everyone was mad. Everyone was mad at me. Gosh. And um, where was I going with this? So, so I went back to the States and um, uh, yeah, right. So I started to have men in black experiences. Oh gosh. When I was 15. Wow. Um, people chasing me down in black cars, trying to run me over cars literally heading for me on the sidewalk where I had to run. On the sidewalk? So they think they're actually trying to run you over? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to kill you? Or scare you, I wonder? Scare me, kill me, I don't know. It was pretty scary. So that happened when I went back to the States. And um, then I started to write a book. This is why I, I said this book is a long time coming. Wow. I started to write a book. So this is like you're 15 years old. Yeah. And some people, um, I had a tape recorder, which I was taping my experiences on. And I had, um, you know, a typewriter and I, I was all set up like a, like a real writer. And I wanted to tell the story. And then these people told my mom that they had to measure the windows and they came back. Uh, they measured the windows, they came back. And the only thing that was stolen from our house 
There's my typewriter. I had a little TV. Record player. <coughs> the record player was left. The TV was left. My typewriter was gone. My record, my record player was gone, and all my writings. Wow, so someone doesn't want you to write. So that was my first experience with having all my writings taken. So I wonder if Men in Black is alien or if it's military. I've heard I have different no stories. Idea. But somebody didn't want this story out. Yeah, I wonder if they're just intimidating you. You think if they wanted to kill you, they could just kill you. Maybe yeah, it's intimidation. Yeah, if they wanted to kill you, they could kill you, right? Yeah, probably intimidating you not to get the story out. Yeah, possibly. So, you know, I mean, it's 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 been it's been like that where I've had <clears throat> different. Uh, different moments in my life when I could write, when I had the time or, you know, enough money to have the time when I wasn't working or when my kids weren't little or whatever, you know, where I start writing. And I've had crazy things like fires. Um, I've had um, internet blow up, modems blow up and blow up my computer with everything in it. Wow. Um, I've had um, floods. <sighs> that only hit certain parts of the house and they were they would be the parts where books are and that's you mean like something thing. flooding from above the floor above or something so, yeah. so, so they would also know that you're writing as well as destroying the writing so you're being tracked in a sense i believe i've been tracked all my life yeah and um yeah so i've that's had a amazing. lot of strange things happen around writing that's amazing, but, yeah. You know, thanks to Dr. Greer and other people that are really out there now, including you, Carrie Cassidy, I mean, citizen disclosure is happening. Yeah. So even if I don't write my book, you know, I've already done an interview with Miles. I'm doing one with you. Yeah, video is powerful, powerful medium. The League Project asked me to do it, you know, and Jaime in Ecuador asked me to do one. And um, uh, Alfred asked me to do one. I don't know if we will get it done, but, you know, I'm trying to get the story out now because uh, it, it seems like the, the time for me yeah. to go ahead and do it, you know. And I have some work to do. I have some work to do. Mm -hmm. um, the things that, that were shown to me on the spaceship by the aliens were a dying Earth, a, a dying Mars <clears throat> with, it was either a cataclysm or a war, lots of shooting, lots of fire, um, people scrambling around. Um, so this must have been your, your, your previous life, right, in Mars? My, my idea is that, you know, just like humans are born on Earth, uh, my, my idea is that people are born on their planet, whatever their planet is. Now, my soul, I think, was hanging out in Mars and being born, having Mars lives until Mars had its cataclysm or war or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, the evidence is it was ruined. a cataclysm. We don't see the no when, but maybe not that, who knows. But, but. but sometimes it seems like it was a war, too. It could have been a war, yeah. You know, so, so well, whatever some people it, say was it was that a war. happened in Mars, they took the children, <laughs> as many children as they could, off Mars, brought them to Earth. And you're one of those children at the time. Yes, that's what the aliens told me on the ship, that I that I had been rescued and taken, yeah. you know, taken off planet and brought to Earth. So it had to have been a previous life. So I think if, if, if the calculations are right that everybody seems to come up with, which is about 13,000 years ago. Yeah, it makes sense. Then that means that my soul has been on this planet for about 13,000 years. We had a cataclysm here as well. Maybe it's a war between the worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our world survived and they got largely wiped out, I guess, 
Speaking of, yeah, relate your experience, your memory of that, because that's a powerful story. And the thing that they were talking about that was really important was the water. They said that we have to watch the water. Um, that it's a sacred, precious thing. And once the water goes, everything goes <coughs> on a planet. And one of them, they had these, these things that were like big tablets. And the bean would push with his finger. Just like an iPad today, right? Like an iPad today. This is April 1967. 1967. Wow. And he would just push like that, and then the next image would come up. But it was funny because the images were like videos. It wasn't just like a photograph coming up. It was like when he passed it, you could see everything happening. Right? Like an alien YouTube. <laughs> was it three three D or two D? Well, I would have to say that I felt like I was there. Wow. So maybe three D, possibly. Wow. You know? I I felt like I was there as a as a consciousness anyway, watching this movie happen. I think you know. if he's showing your own previous life, it would feel like you're there. It's like a memory. Yes, it was a memory. And then I connected with my parents and everything. And it was very, very emotional for me. Wow. I cried for hours after when I realized, you know, what had happened to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things that they, they told me is that I had been born at this time, on this earth at this time, and that I had made a promise to, uh, uh, that I was a volunteer, that I was, that I volunteered to help bring in new energy into the earth, and, um, and to try and help the planet from some kind of disaster. So, Part of my thing was water, and I do a lot of work with water in Mexico. Um, I try to transmute water, you know, talk to the water. Um, I read the books, um, the, that Japanese um, doctor that does the, the water, doctor. Is that um, where they freeze the water? Yeah, and they get the crystals. Different patterns, yeah. Yeah, so I've read his For books. Different emo emotions. And, um, you know, I try to do that whenever I'm in a body of water. I try to send good thoughts to the water. And I haven't really known what else to do other than that, right? Um, but the other thing that apparently I'm here to do is to anchor light. So they showed me how to do that. You know, that the light would come in through the top of your head. Uh, and goes all the way down into the earth and you anchor it into the earth and then you spread your arms and imagine meeting in a triangle form with other points of light. And, mm. and he asked me if I still wanted to do it. I said that yes, I still wanted to volunteer. Mm. So I've been trying to do that since I had the memory of it. I've been uh, trying to do that by myself and whenever I can find other people to do it with you know and I and I have found this one group that does mass meditation so I usually join up with them they do them at solstice times and at very particular times when you know the astrology is just right and you said that their website actually matches what you learned right well if you give me that book for a sec oh yeah it's in here yeah what what I was shown when I had my my vision of what the aliens wanted me to do this was the image that i was shown wow uh where you hold a bit closer to the camera where maybe. the the earth yeah. was like a geodesic dome with points of light the and the the people hugging the people you know t so if you imagined each of these points as being a person or a group of people then each one connected with the others and and, and doing, giving the earth a mantle of light, a protection mantle yeah. of light. With all the stuff that's going on 
on our planet now, on from underneath, which some people call the prison planet. Yeah. That seems like a pretty good idea. <clears throat> so, this is what I've been trying to do, and um, just continuing. And now it's getting a little bigger. Um, some of the people from the meetup group want to do it yeah. with me. So yeah, I can do that as well. I so like I'm I'm really happy. You know, the more the merrier if we do it. Apparently, it helps with ascension. It, um, the all the the grid was actually already finished by 2012. Wow. Um, by the people that the masters and the people that have been doing it, but now what they want to do is they want to make it really, really strong, so that it helps to enlighten everyone yeah. that's on the planet and and to keep the bad things away hopefully I, and I'm not sure we were talking about this last night I'm not sure how that would happen yeah. you know I don't I don't really believe in the rapture that you know no. all of a sudden we're all going to be carried away by aliens or angels into a different thing but I I have a feeling that what happens when you do something like this and you start to do it worldwide and you start communicating with these other groups that are trying to bring light all of a sudden, we're together. We're together, a whole bunch of people together doing the same thing, trying to do the same thing with intention to bring light to the planet. Well, you know, thoughts are things. So even if it's not magical and we get taken by some cloud, you know, maybe what happens is that we all change that our thinking changes you know and that we start not allowing some of these horrible things to happen i mean yeah. there's so many of us there's so many humans and so few people in power that really if there was a resistance you know if there was a a, 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 a resistance program yeah it's true uh what could they really do? I mean, they yeah. can't jail everyone. I guess the problem is we're atomized, we're fractured. There's not a lot of, there's no real unity about what to do. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, because I was shown this by the aliens, by, uh, I shouldn't call them aliens, they were light beings. Yeah. They were very, very evolved light beings. Light shone from their face. They had long white hair, uh, very tall, long, long hands. They yeah, I was going to ask what they looked like when they. Well, I how many fingers did they have when they moved the screen? Um, I, I, I remember them as human, but with longer limbs than us. And now, when you, step when you study science, you know, I I was fourteen years old, so I didn't know shit for shit, right? I didn't know things. But mm. now, looking back and trying to do research on this stuff, you know, when you have less atmosphere even the even the um even the astronauts when they go up and there's less atmosphere if you they've they've done i guess tests or whatever if people were living on mars in a kind of different atmosphere they would be taller longer limbs yeah because smaller gravity smaller light gravity. right so these people were very <laughs> tall very very t long limbs and I remember them as being quite thin and quite tall. I would say at least seven feet tall, the being that talked to me. Wow. Perhaps going into eight. Like, wow. And I've been doing these drawings ever since I was young. Doing these drawings of these very tall people with very long oh. legs and long hair. And, and I, I went back into some of my teenage so were you drawing yeah. that before the incident? No, after. Oh, okay. After. Yeah. I've seen some of my teenage drawings that I had at the time, and that's what I was drawing. Wow. They were about eight feet tall. So the face didn't so, look like gray, it looked more human, not, not like a yeah, gray with big I, eyes? Yeah, I honestly do not believe they were grays. Yeah. They didn't have bodies that were gray. They were human bodies, but longer. Longer bodies and and faces that shone with so much light that I couldn't see their features. It was it a good feeling? It was a fantastic feeling. So it doesn't sound like a military abduction then? No, no. Uh, that, 
That, Seems like a real alien abduction. I think that was a real alien abduction. Yeah. They told me that they were my ancestors. Wow. And that we had all been together, and that that now they don't live on planet, that they travel. That's what they said. <clears throat> they were in a small ship. Actually, it wasn't like a humongous mothership or anything, at least where I was. It was a small ship. Like how small? Like 100 feet or how big? Um, you know, diff different people describe ships in a different way. Like you might see a ship that's the size of a car, but you go in and it's the size of an arena. Yeah. So you can't really gauge. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> what I remember is seeing the ship, which was quite large, it would have been large, getting pulled up into the ship, having the, the, um, the uh, vapor that cleaned my, my clothing. The only thing I had to take off was shoes. I wasn't allowed to bring my shoes into the ship, but the rest of my clothing was disinfected with, with the vapor. And then I was in the room and it was like, I don't know, like this room. And it had rows of seats. They were white leather seats. And there was like three, like a home theater. Wow. There was like three or four in the front and then going up a little bit, another three or four, and then up a little bit. Oh. It was like a theater. Leather and then, seats. And Wait, then leather. he, the main, uh, the main being, he was the one. And he was doing this when he was moving the thing. He was moving it with these two fingers. Now, that's probably the reason I don't remember how many fingers. They didn't say, yeah. I have five fingers. He was just going like that. What right? two fingers mean? The way we would yeah, in a tablet. Fingers. Yeah. So well, Were there other people in the room? I mean, we go like this to the tablets, right? Yeah. When we want to do different Squeeze, things, yeah. different squeezes. And then, we, you know. So he was doing that. I'm sure it was tablet technology. MRI technology, or whatever the MRI was. Yeah, of course, we're 50 years behind, so it kind of makes sense. Yeah, when I got into that little tunnel where they disinfected me, it was like an MRI machine. There you go. And stuff was coming out, and then, and then it lifted me. But I was laying down first, and then by the time I got into the theater room, I was up on my feet. Oh. So it, it had, it, it had, you know, that kind of motion as well, and then I just... It was like a conveyor belt and then it, it stood up. So then I was completely disinfected and I saw the people. But I was explaining to the people in our meetup last night that the feeling that I had with them, if you could put a feeling to paper dolls, the cut out paper dolls that all join hands. Oh yeah. That was the feeling wow. that I had psychologically with them. It felt like we were all connected, like paper dolls would be. Like we were all made of one thing. Were there other people from the community there, though? Or so there was like... there was a few other uh, a few other beings there sitting on the things at the back. I didn't get to meet them. Well, but no but humans. It was a theater no humans. Style. Mean... No, I was the only one. Oh. It was like a theater style, and there was a few of them sitting. Wow. Observing what the main uh, leader or was doing to you. Yeah, it was showing. Wow, that, so interesting, eh? You know, so that was that was my experience on that. Wow. And what I've been wanting to do is, and I've asked Esther to help me with this, is I want to do some more regressions. She does quantum sure. healing. Yeah. She does regressions. I want to go, I want to do more regressions so that I know more of the story. Sure, yeah. And especially one of the parts of the stories that I think would be really important for people, other than the, the idea that Martians did come here, that Martians were human, and they came here, Martian children anyway, and uh, you know, and there was a there was rain and stuff happening on Earth when there was fire from the sky and fire from underneath happening on Mars. Um, to bet the weather was bad here when we arrived, and I. I have a feeling that we went inside the cave. We went to live in the cave. They dropped us off on this thing. So you think there's a lot of rain on Earth at that time? I don't know what, you know, it would be interesting to talk to 
whether people geologists or or people that study ancient weather. Well, there was like uh, eleven thousand six hundred years ago. What well, there's was happening. Yeah, there's two right? things. What happened eleven thousand six hundred years ago? They think uh, comet fragments probably hit the ocean, which caused uh, a lot of water vapor in the air, melting the uh, ice caps, and the water levels rose almost four hundred feet around okay. 11,600 years ago. So that would have caused okay. a lot of rain at that time. Like right. the, the biblical story, the flood, and, and that cultures all the world about the flood come from that. That could explain why they put us up on a mountain with caves. Yeah. They didn't put us down at sea level. We were up in a mountain Yeah, with a cave. And uh, so that's the other thing. I'd like to do some more regressions to find that cave. Um, I think that there's a lot that I haven't explored yet. Well, we know Turkey's this... got a lot of these underground like cities that like Turkey has these caves. Right. The whole camps hold hundreds and hundreds of people. Right. It's very old, yeah. Yeah. Places like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I really have no idea where it could have been because I've seen some interesting caves in Scotland also. You know, um, there were some very interesting caves where my people came from, the Basque people, where my mother's family comes from. Mm -hmm. There's some really interesting caves there too on, on cliffs, so who knows, but I think, I think maybe uh, a few regressions would put all this into perspective and then maybe we could, you know, we could um, explore it a little bit yeah. more to to validate the story i mean i don't care you know i don't care if people want to say that i'm a martian or make fun of me or whatever i'm not doing this to be a famous martian you know I, i'm doing this because if earth is going to suffer the same way that mars is and what we have right now is a secret space program of people on earth trying to move into Mars. Yeah, I think we have that. They're already on Mars now. Okay, so then what do we have? Yeah. What do we have? What do we have? Do we have a repeat of the same situation? Like leave a, leave a planet behind because you've really screwed it up? Like leave it behind and go somewhere else? And, you know, build domes? I, I don't think that Mars was originally a dome city. <laughs> No. I think that they were just, they had atmosphere and they could breathe yeah. and, and there were humans there. Well, I think that is the view of science, that it, yeah. it was a pretty normal planet. Yeah, so, you know, all these people, all these very wealthy people that are trying to, to, to make these, these trips to Mars, I think that they might be, uh, that they, they might be being misdirected as to what to do, you know? Yeah, I'd say it's these Russia globalist bankers have this ability, for, they're probably the ones. You know, right. they, they, they wanna go and colonize Mars. Yeah. They wanna go and live under domes, and they wanna go to a planet that's basically really destroyed, and they wanna, you know, re redo it. Okay, sure, if you wanna turn deserts and, and rocky places into beautiful green places, that's fine. But let's learn from the experience. You know, start to believe people who've had memories like I'm having. Start to believe them. Start to pay attention. What happened? I would really like to know why I was taken out of there. Why my parents had to stay and why people died on the And you said and this is, could be threatening information to the governments and military. they not wanting you to talk about Mars, right? And maybe they don't want you to talk about it. I think in the past they didn't. But now, with disclosure on every level that's coming out, they really it's really unstoppable. It's like they've opened the yeah. faucet and it's just coming. Yeah, and now more people know you about know. the breakaway civilization, people yeah. on Mars. But 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 bothers me is that if there was a beautiful civilization on Mars and they had oceans and they had rivers. I think they did. And they had beautiful trees and atmosphere in the air and blue skies. And whatever and we're going there as explorers as pioneers as conquerors as we've always done all over the earth you know imperialists people have have built empires in every continent that they've they've gone to they've gone to Africa boom 
they did the empire there. They went to South America, boom, they did the empire there. Like, when are we going to stop being yeah. this way? When when are we going to just start looking, like, tell the truth about history? Let's look at history, you know, and let's learn from history. Instead of just plunking up another new settlement and, oh, put your flag there, Mars is ours. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, people from Mars, possibly they live underground, the ones that stayed. The people that contacted me, they're on ships. Yeah. But who's to say that Martians aren't already there? Yeah. Living their lives. So, so for us to go and colonize a planet that already has people, it seems really wrong. To well, me. these are the elites. Elites are wrong. They're, they're always in the wrong. I mean, you know, it's that whole imperialist um, thinking that that people on this planet have always suffered from this greed and imperialism and uh, oh, let's go take it because it's for the taking. But not everything's for the taking. Yeah. But if they, they, if yeah. they have a secret space program, which they do, it's, it's the elites that are doing this. It's not just humanity. It's the elites. You know, they're the problem that cho they're choosing to go to Mars, etc. You know, I mean, let's say that Martian people need help. That for some reason, you know, they need these domes to be there so that they can bring their planet back. And maybe, maybe the Martians are working with the government. We don't know that. But what I'd like to know is I'd like them to tell us what's happening so that we don't start inventing things and imagining stuff that's going on. We're, yeah. Maybe we're imagining that it's a really bad thing that we have a secret space program, but maybe actually we're working with the Martians and helping them put the planet back together. Yeah. Right? And that would be nice to know. What's the whole question of disclosure since 1947, right? They're not, they don't want exactly. to give us disclosure. Yeah, it's and I think that that's what we issue. need, and that's why I'm not going to shut up about it. Yeah, this anymore. is like citizens' disclosure, right? Yeah, I'm not going to not talk about it anymore. Maybe people will think I'm an idiot. Maybe I should go around painting my skin green. But, you know, little green Martian lady. But I'm saying my piece because it happened to me. Yeah. It happened to me. Well, last night and you talked more about know. your actual experience on Mars. You want to do that now, like in the, for the tape, talk about all the, the details, You're like fleeing as a kid and coming to Earth? Um. Oh, I thought that we just did that. Uh, no, because <laughs> last night you talked about they look like helicopters and you're getting on the ship. Oh, and there's right. Like five okay, of you so what, what was happening? What was happening um, on Mars? And maybe, maybe I'll just read it. Maybe yeah. I'll just read this little part. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll read the I'll read the section in here where I'm I'm coming into the ship. When I sat on the chair that was motioned to me, I saw that it had armrests and it was big and comfortable. But because of the unity that I felt in their presence, it almost felt as I was it almost felt as if we were one body connected like paper dolls, one next to each other. It's hard to explain. Uh, it's hard to explain that feeling of, of, of unity. He reached out in front of him with very long arms and very long fingers, and suddenly there was a screen in front of us. He was very, very tall. I judged that he must have been at least seven, maybe even eight feet in height. His fingers touched the screen, and it lit up, just as the tablet does today. But it was very large in front of us both. He told me telepathically that we were that they were travelers and that they did not live on the planet anymore. He wanted me to know that they were my ancestors and to show me where I had come from. Then he touched the screen again and very violent images of explosions and fire began to appear. I could see missiles and comets torpedoing 
down towards the ground. There were people running around all over the place, and they were human. I couldn't see their faces, but I could see that they were all wearing jumpsuits of some kind and moving agitatedly, trying to, trying to do stuff. And, and also they were dodging, dodging all the fire stuff that was coming. The ground was lit up with fires and in some places, and, and some places would suddenly burst into flames from inside the earth, like little explosions coming up from the ground. Fire was coming from the sky. Then there was a helicopter. Then I saw the helicopter that was parked, much, 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 much like the ones we have today, but it was a little rounder in shape. And I don't remember if it had propellers at the top or not. Um, it had no, it had no wings. But I think uh, it says here. But I think it did have some kind of blades at the top. It looked as if it could carry 12 people in three rows of seats. Now, the three rows of seats is what was there when I saw the aliens, but it was different because in their ship, it was an actual spaceship, the rows of seats were, you know, like Coliseum style, like oh, theater style, yeah. one on top of the other like that. In the helicopter, the seats were behind each other and there was less space so no. if you got in there you were in a helicopter space you were in a small <laughs> space but they were getting children in there so it looked like you could get squeeze in 12 people into this thing um it looked as if you could carry 12 people in three rows of seats children were being ushered into the craft quickly and i could see that i was 12 years old and crying trying to cling to my mother and father I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay there with them, but they told me that they were on a rescue mission and that we they were needed there. They said that my uncle would be piloting the helicopter and that everything would be all right, hmm. that he would get us to safety. There were about seven kids all together when we took off. It was impossible to get any more people in that craft because the fires outside were so bad, raging hmm. bad. Wow. I've tried to recall this scene so many times in my mind and I can't get it clearly enough. I don't remember if the rocks and debris were fi and fiery debris coming down or if it was fire from some kind of weapon. I don't know if the situation was a cataclysm or a war. I do remember that methane gas was coming up from the ground and making explosions that went off like landmines. Maybe they were landmines. Maybe it was a war. I don't know, but it, but it did seem like it was all catching fire. As the being was showing me all this, I was crying. I had started to remember the whole thing. Um, when I was watching it, you asked me if it was holographic. Well, it was holographic in the sense that, you know, when you watch a movie, you feel a separation between yourself and the movie. Yeah. When he put these things, when he, when he, moved the screen my consciousness was in there wow and right? you said remember so it's like your so, memory so, yeah my consciousness was in the scene that he was so, showing so he's me. probably showing your memories to remind you yeah so it's it's kind of like uh what do they call it's like an thing? akashic record a record of your history right from long ago yeah 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 but but if we were to put it into today's terms you know those games with everybody's wearing the headsets. Um, what is it? It's 3D. Yeah. Right. So it was 3D, in that yeah. sense. Right. That my consciousness was in there. Wow. And I remembered being that kid. So I was that kid. So it was very much like 3D, like the 3D games that we have now. Yeah. And and the reason I'm saying this is because I think a lot of this technology comes from them. I think so, yeah. Right? Back engineered. Yeah. Because I had no reason to believe in 3D technology when I was 14 in 1967. Yeah. There was no reason for it. There was no, you know, the precursor to it. And yet that is what I saw. Yeah. I they think the transistor might have come from the 1941 Cape Girardeau, Missouri crash. Because it was produced in 1947 too soon around the time of Roswell. So it mm -hmm. might have been 
fact engineer for the 1941 crash. Exactly. Yeah, I think so. I so. think a lot of what we have now comes from these kinds of, you know, either liaisons or what they're able to to back engineer. Or, yeah. You know, or maybe it's given. Yeah. Like some people think that that there were treaties done between the government and some aliens for them to be able to abduct and do different things. Yeah, the 1954 so, Grata Treaty with Eisenhower. Uh, yeah. In exchange for technology, so I don't know. Yeah, it could have been that way. This technology was definitely the technology that I saw there that was way advanced, 50 years advanced to where we are now. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. We could compare it to things that we have now, except no headset. Yeah. Right? There was no headset in when, when I was experiencing this 3D yeah. movie that I was in into in the screen it, there was no headset making me see it that way so hmm. okay so ma many years later when I saw the Superman movie it had an eerie resemblance to what I had seen on screen on that ship oh what what they do so Superman. maybe the Superman movie is telling us not about Krypton maybe it's telling us about Mars yeah, like a lot of truth does get depicted right? in the movies. What part of the Superman movie is it? When they well, were kept on in the Superman apart? movie, there's 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 um, there's a cataclysm happening, like but it, but it, but it, it's triggered by a war. Yeah. Right. And then what they do is they evacuate the children and and, yeah, and they put the baby in the Superman ship. Superman and... gets evacuated all by himself. Yeah. Right. So you know they've taken liberties with it, but but I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually telling the story of Mars. Yeah, could not be. Not ripped on. Could be. Right? Yeah. Because people who make movies have a lot of knowledge that they're given so that I they believe. can prepare the public and stuff like that. So yeah. anyway, the skies had a terrible, oh, sorry. Um, the next part of this memory is of the pilot, my uncle, dropping us children off on a cliff at the mouth of a cliff cave. It was very cold here on earth and it was raining. The skies had a terrible somber dark hue to them even though it was daytime. It was stormy weather. I remember him taking off and we were left to our own devices. We were alone not with one grown-up to guide us or help us. And that's the end of that man. Wow. Could have been that time of big, big rains. <laughs> big rains. Yeah. Yeah. So if if you know, if some cataclysm was happening, I'd love to talk to a scientist who knows this, right? Some cataclysm was happening that was destroying Mars, or you know, uh, Tiamat, or I, I guess that was much earlier Tiamat. But you know, what was happening on Earth? We were getting, you know, if we were if we were getting the what you said, uh, the. Yeah. Asteroids. Yeah, comet fragments comets your, yeah. falling. Probably hitting the ocean. Yeah. Hitting the ocean. The ocean was, you know, it, it probably it would create a lot of rain here. Yeah. So that's the memory. And that's as far as I've been able to go. You know, I need more regressions. They're expensive and I, I, I want to work with someone. So maybe a kid survived. You went into the cave and eventually someone came and got you into care of you, maybe. Maybe, or else we figured it out. Yeah. We figured out how to survive and forgot everything about Mars. People yeah. have often asked me when I when I, I've told this story, and people are interested in not calling me a liar. Um, they say, "Well, what kind of technology did you have on Mars? Did you have ray guns? Did you have?" These are kids, little kids. I probably was one of the oldest, twelve years old. What do twelve-year-olds know about technology? Do yeah. they know how to make a car? No. They're not interested either. Yeah. Right? Do they know how to make a, a mow lawnmower? No. Yeah. You know, you're interested in 12-year-old things. Yeah. So whatever we did to survive, if we didn't have any extra help, or maybe we have human help. Who knows? I don't know. I want to know that. <laughs> I want yeah, to. Likely there would be human beings. Or there'd be, there would have been adults on Earth. If, the whole, whole, if people are fleeing Mars, there would have been right. adults. Yeah. There might have been someone, at least the governments would have known, right? Yeah. So that's the next part that I really would like to investigate. And I'm going to stop my story there. There's more, but yeah. we'll stop there. And 
see if some good Samaritan wants to do some some uh, regressions with me. Yeah, um, yeah. I would really like like to do a few and um, you know put the story, put the rest of the story into the book. Yeah. Which I don't have. You know, I feel that the the book is incomplete at the moment. All I can tell at the moment is you know the things that have happened to me throughout the years in life because of the because of the abduction. abduction yeah and I've been given some healing things to work with through time and I and I feel that I am guided you know in a lot of different oh, ways. Oh do you? Yeah, like, like channeling and channeling impressions? I don't uh, I don't channel but it, I get downloads. Yeah. I don't ever channel, but I do get downloads. Well, downloads is another word for uh, well, not, not channeling, in the sense you're not giving over your body and mind to another, being, you're getting impressions, getting ideas. Um, I don't give it over at all. The download will come, and I'll, I'll sit there quietly. Sometimes it's often they've come when I'm in a bathtub, like in water. They seem to facilitate yeah. the downloads in water like in and then I feel that stuff is coming into my head and some of it I catch. I get that in showers sometimes, my best right. ideas in showers. Well, So by download yeah. you mean ideas, impressions that come to you? Yeah, and baths are even more, Brian. Baths, oh. when you submerge your whole body in baths, yeah. um, you know, and the ocean is even more, Yeah. right? Um, with the chi energy, with the, with the salt and everything, when you submerge yourself in in water that way. Yeah, you know, some people call that channeling when they really they mean it's a download. You're receiving information. Yeah, I call them downloads. I don't call them channeling because I'm not like changing the channel and trying to find somebody. Somebody found me. Yeah, right? that's what I think. And then thinking. they go, well, should, it's time for you to know this, and yeah. then I'll know it. You know, whatever it is, I'll it. know it. Um, I've I've had. All kinds of, you know, you could say, you could say it was my guardian angel that did it or whatever. But I've had all kinds of situations where I've been told, oh, it's time to leave, and then I leave, and and uh, you know, the police will come on oh, that I was on, or you know, I'll leave and there's a fire or a flood. Good. You wow. know, and and if I ever have the feeling not to get on an airplane, I don't do it. Oh. I'll cancel my trip. You know, oh, good. Um, so I do have this Some very guidance strong then. sense of intuition. Yeah, maybe it's protection, guidance. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's guidance from alien beings or if it's just that, you know, they've opened up a channel in me that helps me to access higher, my higher self. It could be Dave as a hard to tell, yeah. You know, but I have been protected in many, many ways. I've been protected from bad things happening. That we're in places where I have been, mm. you know, um, yeah. Interesting. So the uh, men in black can be threatening you, but you're also being protected. I haven't seen the men in black since I was 15. Oh wow! I haven't seen them. I, that, I've had that's after you're back in the states. Maybe in the states they don't want you talking. Maybe, maybe. That intimidation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I came here when I was 17. Oh. Right. Oh. And I haven't seen them here. They've never followed me here. I've had. Floods and fires and all this kind of so stuff. So where were you from 15 to 17? We're still in Ecuador? Uh, from 15 to 17, yeah. I was in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 